<laughs> yes, well, thank you after such a wonderful introduction, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear, dear. This is where the viewers think, what are we talking about? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, yeah, as you know, because uh, both you and I are members of this collaboration, uh, there's a, a very large international collaboration in um, well, it's over the last decade or so uh, called the Event Horizon Telescope, put together the, the resources, the infrastructure, the telescopes in place, recording devices and so on, to image uh, two very specific, or at least two very specific black holes. Uh, and so we put the first image out in uh, April 2019, if you remember, it was the um, the big uh, orange donut looking image. Oh, there it is, yep, yep, of uh, the nearby galaxy M87. So this is the black hole at the very center of that galaxy. Uh, and both Joseph and I were, uh, and actually still remain, uh, in, an integral part of this collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and so, Joseph, would you like to explain your role, and then I can do mine, and we can get on to the sort of juicy stuff. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, so David and I are both uh, members of the EHT collaboration. Uh, we're both active physicists uh, working on it. Um, so I, uh, my role is primarily in the data analysis end, specifically uh, the way we make these images and measurements, um, the processes uh, called imaging and modeling. Um, so I help develop the imaging algorithms that we uh, and software that we make to uh, uh, produce these algorithms, and then I help interpret them by developing and fitting uh, models to the data. Um, my uh, one of the largest contributions to the collaboration, I uh, was one of the lead author. I was the lead author on one of the ten papers that was published uh, describing the information behind the second image of a black hole, uh, the image of Sagittarius Star. And for any noise you hear in the background, that would be Astro Puppy. <laughs> so Hi, Astro he's Puppy. also, he is not an integral member of the HD collaboration. <laughs> well, he should be. He should be, honestly, just yeah. emotional contributions. Yeah. Yeah. Imaging Puppy. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, that was a pretty nice description. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Um, uh, before I go on to my part, uh, you should know that the Event Horizon Telescope is actually a collaboration of of well over 300 collaborators now. And we're talking about scientists and coders and technicians and uh, observatory staff. We are talking about telescope directors, the staff that run the observatories themselves, uh, administrators and facilitators. We're, we're a really big group. Uh, the it, it's, also, uh, it's also worth noting too, that uh, not just a big group like worldwide, but also it's kind of crazy that the EHT has all the people all the way from undergraduates to like yeah. grad students, postdocs, you know, professors, all the way up to like full tenured faculty. It's like, it's really wild. Yeah, no, there's all kinds of career stages. That's a really important point, Joseph, that, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're, I would say we're fairly top heavy. We've got a lot of the sort of career scientists who are um, sort of my stage of their career and above, um, but there are an awful lot of young uh, early career scientists as well. Um, and in fact, to be honest, they're the driving force, they're the real energy of the collaboration. Um, and they sort of put up with those uh, um, old fogies. And we, there's uh, 13 principal uh, stakeholders uh, as institutes that uh, sort of collaborated on this to begin with. Uh, and there are many supporting contributor uh, institutes as well. And so my role in the, in the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, at least a few years ago, I, I've moved on slightly, was uh, program management of uh, basically putting uh, all the ne necessary uh, finances in place, uh, making sure the uh, work teams were able to follow the project plans, uh, talking to the various funding agencies from around the world in terms of, you know, what the funding that we received, you know, taxpayers' money oftentimes, uh, and including some private uh, donations, uh, and making sure that we were sort of doing we, what we were supposed to be doing when we were supposed to do, be doing it. So it helped a great deal with the scheduling and uh, sort of keeping everybody on track. Um, I also was a, a big part of the array uh, uh, coordination group, so basically making sure the telescope, the telescopes, the instrumentation was uh, were ready for observing, which is really nice. And they did a wee bit of science, uh, although nowhere near at the level of you, Joseph. So uh, your Python skills were a little bit above mine. So, so yeah, I think I think uh, your science interpretation was a far greater contribution than me. Ah, uh, that's an extreme exaggeration. <laughs> I'd like to. What's the uh, Twitter? The, sorry, excuse me. X the the feature. It's like a uh, users would like to clarify the misinformation here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah. We 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 both contributed. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Um, also, you're so underrating this, your ability to get 300 cats running in the same yeah. direction. <laughs> Actually, if that is any skill, yes, I definitely had that skill. It's <laughs> quite hard. Yeah. Just getting people to, to, do the, to do the things they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do them and without sort of shouting at each other and niggling and, you know, be acting like 13-year-olds, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that was a pretty big thing to be able to do. Uh, so the event, let's talk a little bit about the Event Horizon Telescope itself. It sounds like it's one telescope. Is, is that true? 
No, so the Event Horizon Telescope, where we say it's a global telescope, uh, and it is true that it ha has the resolving power equivalent to a telescope the size of the Earth, but it's actually a gigantic network of telescopes all over the world. Um, and so in 2017, we made the took the data for the first image of a black hole. I believe we had eight sort of geographically distinct stations, um, and now we've got quite a few more. But uh, these telescopes are spread all around the world. Um, and uh, they we link them up together via a technique called very long baseline interferometry. All you need to know is that uh, about VLBI, as it's called, is that it allows us to take these relatively small telescopes. They're not small at all. Some of them are actually the largest radio telescopes in the world, uh, or the largest you know single moving dishes and stuff. Uh, we take these rel these relatively smaller telescopes and uh, link them together into a single telescope that has far greater resolution than any of the individual ones. Um, and that's the magic of how the EHT functions. So it's a network of radio telescopes that are all functioning as one. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. I think one of, the, you know, one of the real biggies here is, and you can see from the image you've thrown up on the screen here, is uh, the distributed network is, of course, across many uh, continents. But the fact this one down here at the bottom, SPT, which is the South Pole Telescope, um, that's really important because one of the things that turns out to be important in VLBI, the very long, the VL, is that having a long baseline between the systems really allows you to get high spatial uh, resolution. And so the fact you've got this one geographically distinct uh, telescope way down there in Antarctica, uh, obviously one of the driest places in Earth uh, on Earth, so that's really nice uh, as well for, for the weather. Um, but the fact it's so far away from Alma and Apex in Chile and from the 30 meter in Spain and, and the, the two telescopes over there in, um, in Hawaii in the, in the Pacific is the baselines are so huge that means you really do get that very, very fine spatial resolution, which is absolutely critical to, to imaging a black hole. But don't forget, there are some downsides. They're not real downsides, but if you're ever curious as to, you know, we mentioned that we took these observations in 2017, but it took us until 2019 to publish the data. It did take a good amount of time to analyze it and produce the image, but it's because of these remote inaccessible sites like SPT yeah. that made it impossible to get the data back on a short time scale. So, you know, if you try to upload the ESG, I think the order of like multiple petabytes of data throughout the 2017 observation. If That's you wanted huge. to upload that over the over even over a very good internet connection, you're talking 30 years. So it was actually faster just to put all the data on these giant hard drives and fly them uh, back to for analysis. But with the SPT, there's only two planes basically that go in and out of Antarctica twice a year when it's not you know snowing cats and dogs. Um, no offense, Astro Puppy. Um, and, uh, uh, so as a result, we had to wait, you know, six months to get the data from, uh, from SPT. Uh, and that's just, uh, one of the many in fascinating and like very intriguing technological challenges with the array as a whole. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, of course we're in a similar position, not, not quite from the logistics point of view, but the ones, uh, the telescope uh, that's been added recently up there in Greenland, you know, also very inhospitable. Um, when it's uh, when it's winter time up there, so yeah, very very difficult uh, conditions for humans to operate in, and just the mechanics of the telescope itself. Um, so interesting question, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you can answer this really succinctly. Uh, we tell we tell, we've got a couple of sites where there are two telescopes. Uh, one is in in Chile with Alma Apex. Uh, they're they're not co-located, but they're fairly close. I can't remember the exact distance, but it's something like you know twenty or thirty miles. And then there, is, there are the two telescopes there on top of Mauna Kea in, in Hawaii. What's the use in having two telescopes very close together? Why would we bother? Why don't we just want to spread them out as much as possible? So a couple of reasons that immediately come to mind. Uh, one, if you have the two telescopes that are relatively close together, you get a uh, very, very similar baselines, but on two, on two separate combinations of instruments. And so you can calibrate them to each other, those baselines, uh, because they effectively are measuring the same quantity. The second reason that immediately comes to mind is while longer baselines will give you better resolution because they're placed farther apart, we also want accurate measurements of things like the total uh, intensity of the source. And those can only be determined from the very shortest baselines because it's essentially like saying, if, you wanna, if you're looking at an image and you wanna calculate all the photons in the image, you don't care about the detail. You actually want the worst resolution possible so you can just see the total number of photons that you're collecting. Um, and so by putting, taking, having a really short baseline like um, Alma and Apex in Chile or uh, SMA and JCMT in Hawaii, uh, we're effectively like taking off the glasses of the EHT and be like, what's just the overall brightness of this thing? Those are the two reasons yeah. I can think of immediately. Was there any other you had in mind? No, no, I think you explained that really well. I mean, they're very good sort of internal calibrators. 
Uh, and in fact, that's one of the real difficulties in, in putting together eight or nine telescope uh, data sets uh, such, uh, such, uh, with such geographical uh, dis dispersion across the, the globe. It's just combining those data sets both in time um, and in, in energy is very, very difficult. So having two co-located co telescopes or very closely located telescopes really allows you to take out a lot of those calibration difficulties, which are 100% right uh, is the exact reason why we do it. And this, this so kind of self-calibration is this kind of self-calibration is so important when you're taking an image of something that's never been seen yeah. before with an instrument right. that's never been used on that or anything else. <laughs> so like making yeah, sure you right. got the right answer, that's a tough problem. Yeah, it really is. Well, not necessarily the right answer. It's not the answer you're looking for, which is one of the, you know, a great sort of um, thing in science we really aim to do is that we really try to not to work toward an answer. We really try to work toward the truth. Um, but, but knowing the fact that it works correctly as in the instrumentation yeah. is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, so do me a favor, throw that image of the, of the black holes up again, please. The, our wonderful donuts. Sure. <laughs> our eyes of Sauron. Yeah, I, our eyes of Sauron. <laughs> I like that. Very nice. Yeah, so, uh, where are oh yeah, there you go. M87 on top, Sad J star on the bottom. So here's a question I think we should answer, and I think it's important because I ask myself this a lot, certainly as a taxpayer, um, but also just as a scientist. <laughs> And when you pay those taxes, you want to know why people are doing these things, right? Who, who cares? Why should we be imaging black holes? What do we get out of it? Why should Joe or Joanna Public care about what we do? Uh, so I have a very big picture answer to that. Um, but so do you want to, you want to cover any like, uh, like more black, like black scientific reasons? I can talk about what, like the philosophy of these kinds of questions. Yeah, well, I think I think one of the biggest things, and this probably ties into your philosophy, I suspect, but one of the biggest reasons why we, we did this project in particular is because we're always looking for a way to test Einstein. And Einstein is, is sort of prevalent in all kinds of ways in our life, but even things like GPS, for instance. The GPS satellite system does not work without Einstein's corrections to um, general relativity. And so Einstein turns out to be all over the place, and he's never been proved wrong. And so what that means is in any experiment we try to come up with, both in the near term, both in uh, what I mean by that is even uh, with things like solar system objects, which were, we observed in, in 1919 to try and prove his theories, um, and uh, the kind of work we are doing, he's always been able to uh, show that his equations and the way of thinking about the universe is, is more or less correct, with a few tweaks here and there. That to me is unbelievable that you have this, this person who is able to come up with this essentially a humanity changing concept. And even a hundred years later with the most fabulous technology, we still, all the images, everything, all the measurements we make still sort of conform to the theories he laid down. I find that absolutely stunning actually. It's a, it's remarkable. And uh, like uh, the moment that, uh, the moment that we find something wrong, it would, or even slightly deviant from uh, what Einstein sort of laid out, it would result in likely a, uh, an enormous overturning of our understanding of the universe at all levels. Uh, because fundamentally, um, testing gravity if, in these kinds of regimes, you know, it'll also tell us about how gravity behaves on cosmological scales, you know, dictating the, the evolution of the universe and on smaller scales, you know, affecting things like stars and solar systems. Um, uh, and then there's also like the, there's the less philosophical, um, but also like the scientific interests of, um, you know, black holes as these mysterious objects, right? You know, we, we didn't have any real direct evidence that these things even existed until uh, like 2016 with LIGO. And even then it was kind of, you could still maybe argue indirect evidence um, because you were just watching the collision of two black holes or two neutron stars. Um, this was the, for, for a lot of people, there's a fundamental concept of like seeing is believing. And so this was the first yeah. imaged evidence, uh, of, of a black, of the existence of a black hole in the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, I feel like that's an underappreciated aspect, which is that until very, very recently, black holes were considered kind of a fringe idea. Like Einstein himself didn't think they could possibly exist because we didn't know of any mechanism in the universe that could create such an extreme object. One of my favorite books of all time is this book called uh, Perfect Symmetry by Heinz Pagels. And he talks about black holes. It was, it was written, uh, the edition I have was in the late 90s, I think. Um, and uh, in the 90s, you know, he's talking about black holes and he's actually talking about M87 as the best shot we'll have at producing, a, uh, getting a, proving the existence of a black hole. But in the book, this book in the 90s, black holes are just a theoretical 
like almost fictional concept, like, you know, like a, like a, a trick of the math that could explain some stuff, but nobody really thought they were real yet. Like, right. um, it was, uh, it was one of those things you could plausibly deny because no one had seen it. And now, you know, in recent years, we've realized that they drive basically like everything in the universe. Um, and, uh, and now we have ex- evidence of their existence. And that's so, so, so impactful. No, absolutely. And if, in fact, I talked to, talk to my children about this. I, I have four children, four youngest children. And I talk about the impact of science and measuring things is so important and seeing is believing. But there are a couple of other things you can think of. Gravity, obviously, is one of them. You can think of love. I mean, you can't see some of these things, but yet you know they exist. Um, so that's a really interesting concept about how we accept science in even everyday life versus something you can see versus something you can prove. I did, you say, fundamental... uh, did you use love as an example of something you can't see, but... You can't see it, but you feel its effect. Well, I think I I, I would absolutely dispute that i think anybody who's ever seen you interact with the kids has seen love firsthand <laughs> no vlbi array required <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah you can um, definitely I, I do agree with you you can definitely see demonstrations of love but you know i mean i, was, I normally think of gra- in terms of science at least in terms of gravity something you can't really see but you see the effects of and yeah. It's sort of the an antithesis to how we were brought up as scientists is, as you said, seeing is believing, proof is everything, you know, test, test, retest and verify. Everything is related to uh, very sort of concrete uh, uh, substances. The abstract is, is a very difficult thing for a scientist to grasp uh, sometimes, I think. And you know, even this image, these images kind of push the boundary of it. It's yeah. to set to we, we we should probably we're gonna talk more about the EHT stuff this weekend and uh, we're gonna I'm sure we're gonna do a more in depth you know thing in the future addressing some of the questions people have had about the images but uh, despite what you may have heard these are genuine images in that yeah. an image is a collection of fo- a representation of a collection of photons received by a detector um, uh, and they there's been some confusion about whether or not they're a real image because they're not an image in optical light, like almost every other image you've seen. They're not an image from a single CCD, like almost every other image you've ever seen. And so there's questions about what makes an image, you know, uh, and these these images kind of lie on that boundary and therefore on the boundary of what we consider direct evidence and uh, uh, or, or, you know, seeing is believing proof. And so there's there's a lot there's a lot of these images that are that are. Uh, than that more than just a mass measurement of uh, the black holes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I would push back a little bit on that. All most images, at least astronomical images, are, are optical. Of course, James Webb Space Telescope operates very nicely in the uh, in the infrared. Well, what I mean is most images that people consider like images that capture reality as they see it. Yeah, are well, yeah, abs- yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so when, yeah, when people when people no. are like, but is the black hole image an image? I don't think they're necessarily thinking about like Chandra in X ray. <laughs> no, true. No, that's true. Yep, that's right. I agree. All right, so here's a, here's an interesting one that we should cover, and I, I've often asked myself this question. Oh, I, I think I've probably got a reasonable sense of it, but I think it's a very sensible question for somebody to to ask. Is that top image you just showed the nice orange donut? The top one is from Sagittari- Sagittarius A star. And that's the radio source at the center of the Milky Way. The lower one was M87 uh, star, which is the radio source, the black hole at the center of uh, M87, the Messier yeah. 87 yeah. galaxy. That's a, a, a flipped. I'm sorry. I stopped screen sharing because I was uh, having given oh, you yes, audio. Oh, sorry. You're quite right. 100%. Sorry. You're quite right. M87 that was my was fault. On top. Sorry, guys. Uh, M8, uh, Sag A star is on the bottom. Why did we observe these two uh, black holes? Uh, what, was, what, was the, what was the rationale behind it? EHT, most uh, pre- like basically the highest resolution scientific instrument uh, ever created. Uh, the resolution it achieved was unprecedented in the history of any image ever taken. Uh, it required an interferometer as big as the entire Earth. And still, these two are the only black holes that are big enough for us to see. One of them is very nearby. Uh, the spot, the Sagittarius star is actually the, the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The other, M87, is very far away, a thousand times farther away than Sagittarius star, but it's also about a thousand times larger. It's much, much, much bigger than Sagittarius star. And so they are uh, they're both appear relatively gigantic on the sky. And even with all the resolution we have, 
these are still the only two black holes uh, that we have enough resolution to observe this feature, this hole in the middle, which is called their shadow. Um, and so it was not, we, did, we weren't exactly, it wasn't a beggars can be choosers scenario there. We, uh, no, true. we, 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 we took pictures lucky. of what we could see. <laughs> that was yeah. it. <laughs> I do love that effect you're talking about, that two very different objects can have very different sizes, real sizes, yet appear apparently the same size on the sky. Uh, there, are, there is another very famous example of that. And it works very nicely. In fact, we'll talk about it a little bit later in this series. Uh, and of course, later on in the season, when we're going to have a very beautiful little uh, eclipse up here in, in the, um, North America, is the sun and the moon, of course. Vastly different size. You know, the, the, the sun is ginormous, that, millions of times bigger than the moon. I can't remember the exact number, but it's some silly number bigger than the moon. And yet they appear roughly the same size in the sky. Well, we can, uh, we, can, we, can, we can probably estimate, right, by mass. I mean, uh, would you say the moon was 1% of the Earth's mass? Well, so 81, uh, 81 moons are in the Earth. 81 moons in the Earth. So, so it's like uh, what, roughly well, roughly 1%. The Earth is 10 yeah. to the 26 kilograms. Um, so that's like that's a 10 of, the moon would be 10 to the 24. The, 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 hang, on, the, hang on, the Earth is 10 to the 24 kilograms. Oh, 20, okay, so the movie 10 to 22, sun is yep. 10 to the 33, so uh, 33 oh. minus 22, so it's <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, 11. Your numbers, oh, no, your, crap, no, your crap, numbers crap. are all over the place. I know, the, the, I'm messing it up. It's 10 to the 30, one, it's 10 to the 30, 30 kilograms. Right. kilograms. Right. That's correct, correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Earth is, there's about a million Earths in the sun. Yeah, That's right. so it's, about so it's, uh, 81, 81 yeah. million moons in the sun. Right, so it's, a, a, a order 100 million uh, times the sun is an order 100 million times bigger than the moon. Uh, more, more massive, yeah. That's more right. massive, yeah. And yet they appear about the same size. Yep. Wow, which is which just is, unbelievable. It's a massive cosmic coincidence, and it's a cosmic coincidence that we are incredibly, incredibly fortunate to be alive to see, right? Because the moon oh. is moving The moon is moving uh, away from the Earth. So a couple thousand years ago, no, sorry, a couple hundred thousand years ago, yeah. you may not have ever seen a total solar eclipse because uh, uh, the moon would have been, so sorry, a couple hundred thousand oh, years ago, you may not have seen an annular, yeah, you wouldn't have seen an annular solar eclipse right. because the moon would have been so big, it just blotted out the sun entirely. And then a couple hundred thousand years from now, which is like nothing in cosmic time, you would have, uh, uh, you, you, you won't be able to see different. no total eclipse at all, right? Yeah. So, so remarkable. That, that, well, so that's an interesting uh, uh, sort of set of, set of set of circumstances. Do you have a sense of why the moon is move, moving farther away from the Earth? Uh, the moon's moving farther away from Earth. Something to do with the angular momentum of the system, but I can never remember. <laughs> well, that's definitely true, of course. The, the system has to leak angular momentum. Do you know where it's yeah. leaking it from? The rotation of the Earth? Uh, sort of. It's actually... Uh, what, what is one of the biggest effects on Earth that we know about from the moon? The tides. Yes. And so what it is, what it's, it's um, gravitational friction, essentially, where your the, the moon makes the Earth's water, to, the oceans, slosh backward and forward. Well, that dissipates gravitational energy from the moon's orbit. And so it's losing energy. Kind of and so it, it's going to get farther and farther away. So, so it's sort of that gravitational coupling with the, um, the motion of the ocean that the, Earth, the moon is causing. So it's, I find it completely fascinating, actually. So um, I know the ocean obviously has the, we see the biggest impact from the tides, but the moon's gravity also lifts up the continents on the, the tectonic plates on the underlying sort of magma ocean by, I think it's like a couple centimeters. Given the, the more resistance, I assume, and the uh, fact that it's lifting up at, you know, uh, um, land instead of ocean, do, do you think the ocean has, uh, like the, the tides have a greater effect on the dissipation? Or do you think it would be the, the uh the disrupt disruption of the land mass that is a good question i don't know the land mass one's a funny one because it's almost as if the crust breathes right as as the moon yep. is uh, facing it so it rises up and then as it goes around the other side of the earth with the earth's rotation it comes down so you get this very very tiny oscillation and in fact it's measurable uh, you can see it in the in the swiss alps when they send um they can detect uh, when they send beams of, I think what were they sending neutrons uh, neutrinos they could detect the deflection due to the, um, the the sort of breathing of the Alps due to the moon but the, the 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 tides are a wee bit different because they they dissipate the energy so they don't store it and then re-release it it's actually right. being released all the time um, and in a non-uniform way where I think the the the, the crust sort of 
breathing up and down in gravitational space is is pretty uniform. Gotcha. Okay. So that that makes that makes sense. I, I think I think I agree with you there. The ocean probably is doing more of a dissipating job. Yeah, I think I think so too. Yeah. It's, it's I love little thought experiments like that though. Yeah, those, those are fun ones. To think of is that really true or is this the? It's and it's also good to rethink sometimes and say, well, I thought this was happening, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's this. <laughs> right. Like it's, it's sort of almost fun being proved wrong when you you think for something through and it just doesn't make sense. Like, uh, yeah, that can't, that can't work. <laughs> <laughs> well that was pretty nice i like that explanation of why we did those two um those two uh objects in particular uh, sag a star and m87 um, one thing i really loved that you said by the way you said this when we were talking this through before we started recording uh the way to think about combining the light from eight or nine or ten telescopes the monthly, i think we're up to ten now uh, in, the, in the eht is you said you're effectively putting a broken mirror back together and I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it, where the broken mirror is essentially pieces of the telescope all over, or telescopes all over the Earth, but you're putting the light back together from those telescopes. I think that's a great analogy, actually. I really like that. Thanks, David. It, it, it is pretty accurate to what's being done, except instead of you know piecing back a, a mirror like by like a puzzle by hand, you're you're uh, p- putting it back together in a big supercomputer. And I just think yeah, that's, that's such a cool what... aspect. <laughs> All right, here's a question that I'm sure you know the answer to, but it's super super nerdy and super geeky, which I think you and I both class ourselves as geeky nerds. Um, chic ones, perhaps, as, as we try to say in the outro. Uh, combining all those images from all those, or those photons from all those telescopes, how do we combine the right photons? How do we know when they're coming in? Like, Do we time tag them? Do you know how we do that? Yep, of course. Uh, so uh, at each of the sites, we have an atomic clock uh, called a hydrogen maser clock that measures down to the nanosecond what time photons are being received. Uh, and then when we put them all together back in the supercomputer, we can line up the timestamps and collect the light that was being, uh, uh, the. we can collect the, basically reconstruct the individual electromagnetic waves that were reaching the different sites at exactly the same time. And of course, because the sites are on different points of the earth, and depending on how the Earth is rotate, uh, depending on how the Earth is, appears to the object, there's going to be different, slightly different time delays uh, for how long the light took to reach one site or another. Uh, and so, as a result, you have to do this incredibly careful balance, uh, this incredibly careful like puzzle piecing act of uh, figuring out when the light from a single electromagnetic magnetic wave from the black hole hits each of the telescopes individually. And uh, it's a uh, uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly complex and cool problem. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. No, when I first started, started uh, working for the EHT as a program manager at the Smithsonian, it was just so, so staggering to how well we could time tag these incoming photons. Um, I think the craziest actually... bit was like, I mean, hearing this problem and then you come in and realize it's basically solved because, it's solved. The, yeah. because the geniuses that came that are working Before. on this now are just too right. smart. <laughs> Well, I mean, in, I think I think it's fair to say in most science, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants in the past and we, we take on their, their unbelievable foundational work and, and hopefully take it f- further. But it's it's incredible what, what, what our predecessors have worked out and being able to solve. Um, and just as you were talking, I did go ahead and check online. I did Google uh, the time resolution of a hydrogen maser clock. Uh, they can they can measure stable time stamps to within about half a nanosecond that's half a billionth of a second over 12 hours that's ridiculous which is just stunning actually when you think about it and of course it's due due to the regularity of the um of the atomic uh uh, uh, transitions of the electrons it's just stunning you know uh, um the hydrogen the sensitivity of hydrogen maser clocks is a the basis of one of my favorite eht stories um I don't know if you remember this one, but uh, during the 2017 observations, uh, so the hydrogen maser clocks, in order to operate this efficiently, and it's extremely important that they keep the time well, they have to be extremely well cooled. And uh, um, well, uh, in the 2017 observations, one of the hydrogen maser clock hydrogen maser clock cooling systems broke basically. And uh, when you're at a telescope, you know, hundreds of miles away from the nearest engineer that could help, and the observation starting in five minutes. Um, it's a kind of a problem. And yeah. so, uh, it led to one of, uh, the funniest hacks I've ever seen, which is, a uh, 
they couldn't cool down. They couldn't repair the uh, the, the, the uh, ast- astronomers on site couldn't repair the hydrogen maser clock cooling system, so they just taped the door open to let the let the room cool. <laughs> and uh, it led it led there's a there's a Smithsonian documentary about the making the image, and it led to this amazing line in it where they just like had this dramatic zoom in on the tape. And uh, on the piece of tape, and the the, the the announcer just says this incredibly dramatic voice, he's like, "This piece of tape should hold the door open long enough for the uh, data to be collected. If not, the entire observation could fail." <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's like, well, that's you know, if you wanna if you wanna talk about like it, the healthy dose of luck we needed to. Yeah. Uh, that's it right there. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you sort of, and this happened in 1919 where uh, they were observing the uh, um, the transit of Venus, looking for the deflection of the star from behind for, for to test uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And uh, one of the sites was cloudy. And then just as they were about to think, oh gosh, we you know we've missed the opportunity, it cleared up and they got the observation and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, they could see the uh, gravitational deflection of this, of this object. Which, uh, which experiment was this? Uh, so it was in 1919. It was. Oh, it was oh wait, that's not. That was in Venus. That was a. Uh, that was that, that was in Venus. That was a, the Eddington experiment, right? With uh, it was a solar eclipse. They measured the positions of stars before and after. Right? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. That's what. It, that's right. You're right. Sorry, it was a solar eclipse. But they, but they were taking. They were trying to calculate the gravitational deflection due to due to general relativity. Yeah. And Einstein had predicted, you know, like a half an arc second deflection, and it turned out to be spot on. That was it. It was a solar eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just a look. It's just, it's so much astronomy is just, well, I hope it's not cloudy tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I, I've, I've been on telescopes about 1600 nights, maybe a little bit more of my career. And I've had about 85% clear nights, which is a staggering number. M- That's just, what yeah. are you, what goat did you sacrifice? What deal deal with the devil did you make to get eighty five percent clear nights? Well, I used to have an observing teddy bear, and I, I I used to always sit in the control room with me. And if if observing teddy bear wasn't there, if I'd left it down in the dormitories, I was really upset because like, it's going to be cloudy tonight. And uh, it wasn't a one to one correlation, but observing teddy kept me clear for a long, long time. <laughs> That's very very funny, and I wonder how much of that is a. Uh... If you just had 85% clear nights and you had observing Teddy there 95% of the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Teddy, you, you failed me 10% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's, your, what's your p-value for observing <laughs> Teddy? Well, it could be sort of the Darth Vader thing of you have, you have failed me for the last time observing <laughs> Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you remember in, in Empire Strikes Back where he does the... Uh, he's oh, Absolutely. Uh, Apple Absolutely. I still have that Teddy funny enough. Yeah, that was my favorite part of Empire Strikes Back when he does that to observing Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, um, look, I know we've got a, I know we've got a big, uh, we're going to do 